Welcome to another episode of the Modern Classic series here on the Classic Car TV YouTube channel. My name is Vince Holton and I've been running the channel for quite a while now, but the Modern Classic series is new. We kicked off with the first video which covered the McLaren MP4-12C. Maybe you've seen that video and hopefully if you like the format you have subscribed to the channel. If you haven't it would be great if you did. I'll put a link to the McLaren video in the comments section below. This time we're looking at another make of cars, one that has a huge global following. I'm talking about Porsche of course. I've had some nice cars in my time, um, but I've probably had more Porsches than anything else. I am a bit of a Porsche guy. Pretty much all Porsches are special cars, but as with most things, some are more special with others. And in the case of Porsches, the special ones generally have the letters R and S in their names, which stands for Rennsport or Racing Sport, Sport Racing. Porsches produced a series of RS cars and they're typically lighter, more powerful, have firmer suspension and more stripped out than the regular cars. They're regarded as something for the purists really. And despite the fact that they've got less equipment than the other cars, they generally cost more too. But there's a special reason to be looking at the RS cars now. And that's because 50 years ago this year, at the Paris Auto Show, Porsche introduced the 911 2.7 RS, a truly iconic car. That car went on to set the mould for a series of air-cooled RS 911s, including the subsequent 964 RS and the 993 RS that you see here. The RS legend continues today, of course, with the water-cooled cars, but now the RSs are even more developed versions of what they call the GT series cars, the GT2, the GT3 and the GT4. So what better time could there be to look at the air-cooled 911 RSs? And I've managed to bring together all three cars, 2.7, 964 and 993, and to bring them together in one place at one time to drive them, to film them and to make this video. It's an incredible opportunity. We'll look at the individual cars in a moment, but let's stick with the modern classics film format. These films aren't about me pitching myself as an expert and doing car reviews. I like to bring on board people who really know what they're talking about. For this movie, I've interviewed two of the most knowledgeable 911 guys in the UK, both of whom will be very well known to a large part of the UK Porsche community. We have Josh Sadler, who in 1972 created a business called Auto Farm in partnership with Steve Carr. Josh ran Auto Farm for 43 years until he sold his share of the business to his co-directors in 2015. During his 43 years of running Auto Farm, Josh prepared, developed, sold, serviced and raced Porsches of every type. Nowadays, even though he's theoretically in retirement, he can still be seen at Auto Farm from time to time. And if he's not there, he's probably at home tinkering with one of his cars, maybe preparing one of them for some historic motorsport, including the beautiful 2.7 RS you see here. Then we have Phil Hindley. Like Josh, Phil's company Tech9 has been developing, servicing, preparing, selling and racing Porsches for decades. There's plenty of trophies in the Tech9 cabinet. Put simply, both of these guys are true died in the wool, Porsche enthusiasts, and really know what they're talking about. They probably know more about 911s and the RS cars than anybody else on the planet. So perfect for me to talk to them. But before we get into the interviews, let's take a closer look at the three cars we're featuring in this movie. Let's kick off with what will be, for most people, the star of the show. The 1973 2.7 RS, of course. Most of you will know the story. The 27RS was developed from the 2.4S and has a bigger 2.7 litre engine that develops 210 horsepower and 150 newton metres of torque. 2.4 litres had been thought of as the limit for this engine, the problem being that if Porsche increased the capacity above this, the cylinder walls became dangerously thin. However, the granddaddy of Porsches, the 917, had already tackled this problem. Instead of using a relatively thick cast iron liner, the 917's flat 12 had used a nickel carbide called Nicosil, which was also low friction, and Porsche used the same approach for the 27. 
Porsche used an electrolytic deposit system that put the nicosyl material directly onto the aluminium cylinder bores in a layer just a few hundredths of a millimetre thick. This allowed a bore increase to 90 millimetres, increasing the capacity to 2687cc while retaining a thick aluminium cylinder wall for strength. Porsche did though use the same valves and compression ratio as the 2.4. The car has Bosch mechanical fuel injection, revised and stiffened suspension, that iconic ductile rear spoiler, larger brakes and staggered size wider wheels, 6 inch at the front and 7s at the back. There were two versions. The M472 Touring, which weighed 1,075 kilos or 2,370 pounds, and the M471 or Lightweight, which is about 100 kilograms or 220 pounds lighter. A total of 1,580 27RSs were built. The first 17 cars were badged RSH, H being for homologation. There were 200 Lightweights and 1,308 Tourings. Rounding out the total of 1,580, 55 RSR racing cars were also built. From this total there were just 111 right-hand drive 27RSs. These were 17 lightweights and 94 Tourings, and this car is one of the right-hand drive Tourings. It was first registered in 1973, of course, and as far as we know, this is the only right-hand drive 27RS in this colour, which is called Golf Orange. Other interesting details of this particular car include the fact that the chassis number is 0928 and the engine number is 6630911. All of this information is contained in the 27RS Bible, a book called Carrera RS. This was written by Dr George Conradstein and Dr Thomas Gruber and was first published by TAG Verlag in 1992. This print sold out and has since been a reprint with even more content. First issue copies of this book sell for about £3,000, that's if you can find one. This tome includes details of every 2.7 RS ever built, car by car. We can look at the entry for this actual car and see every detail of the spec as it came out of the factory. We can also research everything you might ever want to know about the 2.7 RS, including how many cars were made in each colour. Talking of colours, and the colour orange in particular, did you realise that 1973 was the year that Porsche made a change to its badge colour? If you look at the key fob and badge for this 27, you'll see that the background colour on the Porsche shield is orange. In 1973 that changed to red. I think you call this the minutiae, the stuff that Porsche fanatics love to talk about. Anyway, this car's in stunning condition, it's a joy to drive. We'll come on to the 964 and 993 in a moment, but there's a marked difference between the driving experience of this car compared to the other two. Just sitting in it is different. It's got relatively soft, comfortable seats and compliant suspension. I'm not trying to say that this is a luxurious car, but if you jump backwards and forwards between all three, this one definitely feels the most day-to-day -day livable. It's the oldest, of course, 50 years old, are nearly 20 years older than the 964. So it does feel more like a classic car, and some of the fixtures and fittings have an early 911 feel about them. But as I said, it's a joy to drive, and you can see why they're so loved. That love and the desire to own a 27RS means they're valuable too. By far the most valuable of these three cars. Most pundits seem to think that £750,000 or about $900,000 is the entry level for a 27RS these days and had been sales over a million pounds. To many people in the know, the 27RS is now a million pound plus car. Moving on to the 964RS, this is a different beast. This car was a shock to the world when it was introduced in 1992, with many journalists believing it was just too hardcore for the road too much like a competition car. The 964 RS was based on Porsche's 911 Carrera Cup race car. Its stripped out interior has no electric windows or seats, no rear seats, no air conditioning, sound deadening or stereo system and had racing bucket front seats. Left hand drive cars like this one have no power steering, though this was fitted to right hand drive cars. The front hood's made of aluminium and the chassis was seam welded. 
The gorgeous wheels were made of magnesium and the glass is thinner in the doors and rear window. The 3.6 engine produces 260 horsepower and the car weighs 1230 kilos or 2712 pounds. And there's a track oriented suspension system with 40 millimeter lower ride height, stiffer springs, shocks and adjustable stabilizer bars. Be in no doubt, this is a serious car. A total of 1986 964 RSs were built, 110 of which were right hand drive, as is a German registered left hand drive car in a rare colour known as Amethyst. Driving this car is a very different proposition to the 2.7. A 964 RS is a super mechanical analogue car. It feels very small on the road, which is good. The steering is heavy, the clutch is heavy and the suspension is super firm. The 964 RS will give you a real workout, but grab it by the scruff of the neck, aim it down the road and put your foot in and you'll enjoy a driving experience unmatched by many other cars. It's loud, it's hard and it can be a bit intimidating, but on the right road it will make a 911 enthusiast's heart sore. 964 RS values have risen fast too. You're unlikely to see one below about £160,000. These days, most are just below or just above 200000 with really rare or special cars selling for £250,000 plus or about $300,000. And then we have the 993 RS. This was produced in 1995 and 1996. That's not long after the 964 RS, but it's a very different car, feeling a lot more modern and sophisticated. The 3.8 engine introduced VariaRam variable length intake manifold technology and puts out 300 horsepower. There's a six speed, short shift gearbox and drilled and vented discs. The 993 RS is still a light car, weighing 1280 kilos or 2822 pounds. This was again achieved by measures such as an aluminium bonnet, lighter glass, no rear seats, simple door cards and so on. The ride height was lowered and there were Bilstein dampers. The 993 RS is, by some margin, the rarest of the air-cooled RSs. Only 1,014 were built, including 213 Club Sport variants and only 48 were right-hand drive. The 993 RS wasn't approved for export to the USA. The Riviera blue car we're featuring here was sold new into Switzerland, where the first owner raced it. It's rare in that it came out of the factory with the big wing option. The normal wing option is the one seen on the 993 RS that I owned, seen here. This car, as befits its racing routes, also features firmer suspension, a roll cage, a loud exhaust and full harnesses. It's effectively a club sports car and it's fair to say it's well what you might call tracky. And it's a hoot to drive. Strapped into the Recaro seats with the full harnesses grabbing you and the utterly gorgeous Momo Alcantara wheel in your hands, it's hard not to get into full-on race mode. While the 964 RS requires you to grab it by the scruff of the neck Use your shoulders, not your wrists, and hammers the road into submission. The 993 RS feels more sophisticated. It's still firm, yes, but there's a degree of flow to the way a 993 RS attacks a road. It may only be three or four years newer than the 964, but it feels way more modern. The driving experience is, well, sublime. It may be the rarest air-cooled 911 RS, but the 993 isn't the most valuable. That honour stays with the 27. No, the 993 sits between the 964 and the 27 value wise. 993 RSs seem to trade in the 225 to 350,000 pounds bracket. And this car, in the immaculate condition it's in, and with the factory big wing, will be nearer the top of that range. Right, now that we know a bit about the cars, let's get into the interviews and hear from the real experts. I asked the question that seems to be setting everybody the biggest challenge. What is a classic car? And when does a modern car become a classic? A classic car is something you can fiddle about with at home. 
something that's got um, idiosyncrasies, characteristics which modern computers have ironed out now, um, something that's got a story to tell, um, has lived life, um, even if it's been mollycoddled for decades, you're talking about something that's um, got a life story. For me, whether it's 50-year-old RS or a 100-year-old Austin 7, um, it's uh, something I can work on at home, something that when you drive it isn't perfect um, and it, it all has its little challenges, um, something that um, is old enough for people out there to appreciate it as a, um, an interesting period art form, if you like. Okay, so yeah, I, I, thinking about that, you, the car starts off as a new car and has desirability as the new latest car, and then its desirability over a few years wanes, and they, they sort of get to a, a bit of a trough um, where everybody's looking at the, the new latest and greatest. Now, and I think back to the period, you know, of the early 90s, the, the 964 RS was the, the new car, the new kid on the block. And I look back at, say, a 27 RS, which I'd, I'd loved. I loved the sound of them and how raw and, and sharp they were from period. But by that time, they were a 20 year old car. And, you know, yeah, the 964 RS came out when it was new. Recall them in the showroom. We even were involved with, with them, you know, brand new cars that we helped prepare for, for track use. Um, so cars go through a transition, go through a period. And, and I think if you put a number on it, I would say you get to 30 years and, and it's a classic. I, I find the modern classics, as they call them, uh, they're stunning cars. And performance envelopes are completely ridiculous on the road, um, hence track days. Um, but they're, they haven't got a story yet. And will they survive with all their electronics and what have you uh, in a, a DIYable form? Will in 50 years' time you'd be able to potter away with whatever the current thing is, um, Carrera GTs, um, spiders. Uh, would you be able to do it at home? Your general buyer is maybe 50, 50 something. They've got a bit of disposal income. Um, they, you know, the, 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 the overheads have reduced, the mortgages payments have dropped, the, the school fees have dropped. And you know, people with disposable income look back at that period and think, well, when I was 18, 20, 22, those cars were amazing. And then they can afford those cars. And I think we've seen that through the generations that that, that happens. So I think the 30 year rule, you, you ask the question, what do I consider a classic? I think 30 years and, and onwards is, is, the, is the window for them. Uh, it's it's a, an increasing number of people looking for a limited number of vehicles. Hence, the investment market, which you can argue both ways as a good and bad thing. Then, having managed to gather together a 2.7 RS, a 964 RS and a 993 RS, I asked the guys if they thought that these three cars were, without doubt, already solid gold modern classics. Yeah, I, I, they're right in the sweet spot. You know, definitely the 27 RS, definitely the 964 RS, and we're approaching 30 years for the for the 993 RS. Um, so yeah, they are they are all in the category of modern classics. Um, in fact, if you asked me, I think they are classics now, and I think the modern classics that uh, of the period are probably getting into the nine, you know the water cooled era as we as we speak. Like that's yeah, that's my opinion. The the nine will a nine six I think a nine six four nine nine three RSs they they are already appreciated vehicles. They are in that period between a modern classic, um, which is a supercar, um, and and uh, the world I come from. And I I th I think they'll always be appreciated for where they sit in history. Um, and they are better cars, um, higher performance, better handling, um, better brakes. Everything's better about them and natural evolution of things. I then asked Josh and Phil to consider the individual cars, their special characteristics. And was any one of them more special than the others? 
the, the, the 27 is more idiosyncratic. Um, it, it's got its, uh, um, its things like a lift off oversteer, which um, they were increasingly dialing out, especially with the 993 LISAC back end. Um, it, uh, the, the, the 27RS, you, you, you've got to know what you're driving. You've got to get, your, get a handle on it and um, really apply yourself because it's got its challenges. I can remember when the ducktail first appeared and I thought, what a strange looking piece of kit that is. <laughs> That'll make people scratch their heads. But um, it, it worked. As a piece of aerodynamics, it worked. Um, we had this huge argument when the production racing started. Um, if it uh, wasn't a 73RS, you couldn't run a ducktail. And um, the counter argument being, well, you know, keep it on the track without a ducktail. <laughs> oh dear, I remember that well. Um, you don't drive so bloody fast then. <laughs> Ooh, yeah, I mean, all, you know, fantastic cars. If I think back, 27RS was unique. In, you know, in 1972, when it, when it came out, it was completely unique. Um, you know, the, the, the look of it, the spoilers, the power, the wheels, everything about it. And it was, it was a no compromise development from motorsport, from what Porsche were doing in period, the motorsport success. And, and it was a, you know, it was look what we can produce, you know, in a, in a time in the 70s where, you know, the, you know, the fuel crisis was, was heading, heading um, that way. And it was, it was an incredible piece of engineering. And to this day, it, it retains that charm factor. And obviously the 2.7 was, as the first, achieved uh, a, a very unique spot in Porsche's history. It arrived just before um, all the American emissions and crash resist resistance legislation started to come in. And in fact, if you look at any sports car from the 70s, you can see it hit an evolution point where it was having to have big bumpers and. Um, more efficient injection systems, um, carburetors became history, um, just to meet modern le legislation, let alone um, uh, evolving engineering and evolving electronics. Um, so the, the, the 73 RS was the last of the pure. But it's a 70s car. It, it's, it, it feels like a 70s car. Um, when you when you drive them, the the, the impression is that uh, that you get immediately. It's completely analog. You know, no power steering, um, lightweight, um, responsive. Um, I mean, that engine you get it on cam, and uh, yeah, the, the the power band from 4000 to the red line, it just absolutely sings. And the and the the lack of weight, that manual steering, skinny tires. I will say the brakes. You have to be careful with the brakes because I always think that on the road to drive towards the limits of a car, you need to have good brakes. You need to have that confidence that if something happens, you can deal with it. And you, you always leave a bit in reserve with the 27 RS because of, because of the brakes. But yeah, yeah, fantastic car. Um, the, the, the 964 RS, um, when it, again, when I first um, had opportunity to drive one, um, it, it, it's a more track focused car. Um, track days were getting established and um, Porsche were um, running their sponsored race series. Um, uh, and it was, it, it's a challenging car in the wet, um, but then it's very easy to soften the suspension a little bit to make it, you put 993 front struts on it and that, that makes it far more da daily user in the winter. Um, it, it is an impressive piece of kit. 964 RS um, was uh, a very sharp road car. Um, it's a um, yeah, fantastic engine, but you've, you know, you're 20 years on, 20 years of development. You've got some more creature comforts. You, you have power steering, you have ABS, albeit it was the first incarnation of ABS and it was rather primitive. Um, but the, the car, coilover suspension, uh, a decent heating system, heating and ventilation, 
So it was, it was a step forward, you know, not quite as raw as a 2.7 RS, but in the day compared to everything else, it was, it was a raw car. The 964 RS wasn't raced as much because you had the 964 Cup car, but they were the track day uh, car of choice in, in period. And, and I recall in the 90s doing so many track days and preparing so many of those cars for track. The, the injection system made no concessions to fuel efficiency whatsoever. Um, you struggle to get 20 mpg. You can get um, maybe into the mid 20s if you're you're very careful, but um, they're, they're not fuel efficient. But they are huge fun, and and the, the multiple butterfly injection system makes the engine characteristic, and the response um, absolutely brilliant. Had lots of them in period brought lots of them in from Germany at the time they were cheap cars again we talk about this cycle of cars being new and then dropping in value we hit those cars right at the sweet spot you know we were paying 18 20 grand for a for a 964 RS and um, yeah they were they were selling like hotcakes there was quite a few people doing it 993 RS um, more of a comfort uh, comfortable car um, development on the suspension you've got the multi-link suspension that was a big step in the day, that multi-link suspension. I raced a 964 C2 in the, in the production championship, and on the limits, the 964 is a handful. It, if you get the car on the limits, just at the point where if something changes and you have to change the attitude of the car, the, the toe correction in the, in the rear trailing arms would make the car do something really odd and random, and it was, it was a handful. And you know myself and quite a few other people in period were um, were guilty of uh, spitting these cars off into the barriers because they just yeah they they, they let go and they they bit the 993 RS with the multi-link suspension was a different animal on the limits you could hold those cars complete drift them they were predictable much more supple the 993 RS engine you got 3.8 you've got uh, Varia RAM and um, a much more linear power delivery. The 964 being 3.6 was quite peaky. Um, the 993 with the 3.8 was very linear. So it didn't quite feel as fast as the 964 RS, but obviously the numbers tell you different, that it, it, is, a, it is a very capable car. In the world of RS Porsches, one of the biggest debates is just how much difference is there between a 27 lightweight and a 27 touring, and which one should a collector buy? By definition, uh, if you're in, in a, looking at a collector model, um, the rarer versions are always going to be the preferred ones. Mine is the only purple one. You know, there's stuff like that. It, um, yeah, I, I, can, I can understand that. Um, and uh, so, so yes, the lightweight was, by definition, the purer form, although mechanically identical. Um, there really wasn't anything mechanically different on a lightweight um, it was just basic I guess it depends on budget if you if you have the budget to put together the best collection available you you've obviously got to go for a lightweight um, we've been fortunate to restore uh, uh, two seven rs's including a, a very rare right hand drive lightweight that was used in uh, in rallying in the 70s of which a lot of them were you know in the day the cars were, um, yeah, they were a, a turnkey race car. You could, you could go to the showroom and buy a, buy a 2.7 RS and you could compete with it, whether it be circuit racing or rallying. Uh, with a few minor changes, they were, they were a great car. It's the concept that appeared in, with the 911R back in um, the late 60s, um, which is when Porsche realized that there was a marketplace for simplified versions of their 911. Um, which was started with what they called the T-Rally in 68 and then went on to what the marketplace has come to call the ST. Um, Porsche realised that this, um, they, they labelled the simple package, the M471 package. Um, in actual fact, it goes back into the 60s that uh, you can look at a T-Rally from 68 and, oh look, it's an RS lightweight inside. Um, they just made it a proper production model with the 73 RS. It, they, they homologated the car at 900 kilograms. You can't 
build them to nine. You can't strip them out and make them nine kilograms without using titanium and all sorts of modern tricks. Um, so how the devil did they do it? Well, they did it by removing everything they could think of that didn't stop it going. They, I, I think they took the anti-roll bars off, for starters. They put skinny wheels and tyres on um, and rolled them through the homologation process and then rolled them back again. I, I have this theory about uh, there, there are a few um, that never got classified as touring or lightweights. So they're homologation ones, just a small handful. And uh, my, my theory is that the, the first owner, the person who placed an order, never defined the order. They were too busy or too wealthy or too international or what have you. So the car came to be specced for, for the first owner and said, oh, we haven't got the details yet, so we'll put it out into the sale room and worry about it later. Cause you've got to change to put proper wheels and tyres on for starters. You know, so it, uh, it's, it's one of those sort of odd things in the whole series. I mean, the mere fact that they ran them through the homologation process and then built a, a separate workshop, which they then ran the car through the separate workshop and converted them to whatever the customer requirement was at the other end. I mean, it's a f and, and you can t you, if you get an early touring, if you take the carpet out, underneath is all the little bits of black lightweight carpet that's stuck in the glue. So they really did do it. <laughs> it, um, I, it, it's, it was a production process that would never fit the modern world. In terms of driving performance, Differences between a lightweight and a touring aren't massive. Uh, they're not massive, but it's just when you sit in a, in a lightweight, it's special. You look around you, you know, the, the lack of creature comforts, the, uh, the, the rawness of that car. You drive it down, as soon as you drive it down the road, it is, it's alive, it's instant. Um, yeah, it's yeah, very special. So I, I say if you can afford, then obviously the lightweight is the car to go. And sales pe people were uh, proved very wrong. Um, and their concern about how many they could sell. Um, and uh, um, the 200 lightweights have very much got a commanding place in the, um, you can make a lightweight out of a touring and you can feel the difference that getting a thick end of 100 kilo off the car, chucking the passenger out in effect, you can always feel that um, when you really get to know any car, if you chuck the passenger out, it. Uh, <laughs> It always goes better. <laughs> In its day, journalists described the 964 RS as too harsh for a road car. So I asked Josh and Phil whether they thought that was the case. Is the 964 RS too much like a race car? It was, uh, without question. Uh, the journalists um, uh, had a good analogy of the car in the day um, and we were responsible for developing those cars for road use. For instance, the the, the front suspension that uh, the factory fitted had far too much rebound control and on a, on a smooth road or a, or a smooth circuit, fantastic. But as soon as you took the car on a, on a bumpy road or a bumpy circuit, then the front would, uh, the front would patter and uh, it, was, it was dangerous. I mean, if, if you're on a bumpy road and you're pressing on, you know, on a number of occasions, I'd have the front jump across the road and, you know, you'd have a moment. The, the original ones, um, as, I, as I said, uh, a 964 RS in the wet is a, it's a fairly dodgy animal, but uh, it's very simple to just soften the suspension a little bit um, with suspension components from the 993, um, which was a, a, a far more versatile um, car. So, we, so in, in period, we did quite a bit of work on those cars. The main thing we did was the front, uh, front dampers, change the dampers to be more compliant. Um, and I think back, um, by the time the 964 RS was two or three years old, people started to play with them, and the 993 RS had the hot film airflow sensor. So this was, this was the hot ticket, really. This was the key to, to making power. The, the 964 RS had a flat type airflow meter, which was quite restrictive and with a, an ECU remap and a hot film sensor and a few mods to the exhaust, a cut pipe and a few little bits, uh, we were getting 300 horsepower out of those cars. 
So that was a real common modification in the day. It was front dampers, probably a strut brace, um, uprated fluid and brake pads, and then a 300 horsepower conversion. And then you had, you had a fantastic car. You could drive it to the track, race it around the track, and, uh, and drive it home. And it was a, it was a, yeah, a very successful uh, car for, for doing track days and period. And so you can quite easily make a 964 RS a, a, a far more roadable vehicle. Um, but yes, the, 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 the basic form, especially if it was a club sport version with its full built-in ro roll cage and no carpet at all. And I mean, obviously that was pure track focus. Um, but equally, they did, they did a touring version, but it didn't sell any because <laughs> everybody wanted the performance animal which I mean, there's always somebody in the press that'll say it's either beautiful or dreadful. Well, the 993 RS feels like a much more modern car than the 27 or the 964 RS. It feels like something of a halfway house between the air-cooled cars and the later water-cooled cars. Some say it's one of the best 911s of all to drive. Ask the guys what they thought. No, I w no, I wouldn't say halfway house. It, it's it, it was a it was a development. I mean, it's 903 RS is the rarest of the of the three RSs you're talking about. It was it was built in the lowest numbers. It has the highest power to weight ratio. So, from a desirability point of view, you have to say that the 903 RS ticks all the boxes. Yeah, I suppose you're right. It it, um, it uh, each specific model series uh, acts as a bridge to the next, but as the last of the air called, um, yet a sophisticated car, um, in ter both in terms of suspension and uh, engine management systems with the Varia RAM system. Um, it, it was certainly, it was a bridge to the, um, what was to follow. The final evolution of the air called engine and a fantastic car. You have to say at the time Porsche built that car, Porsche, you know, weren't in the position they are today. You know, finances weren't brimming like, like they are today. And I'm sure the car was built with a bit of compromise, but they looked at a target audience, built it in limited numbers, and it, and it sold well. A late 993 is a remarkably sorted, thoroughly developed, extremely usable motor car um, but uh, equally it's a lot more sophisticated than the the originals I grew up with and uh, I find it much more difficult fiddling about with an old 993 at home than I do with um, the, the 73 and earlier cars they came out of the factory with a bit of an issue. Uh, Porsche had um, cut production costs in a, in a lot of areas on the 993. And one of the things they did was they fitted, um, they fitted interference fit uh, camshaft uh, drive wheels. And the previous generations had all had a, a really nice vernier uh, cam wheel, which was locked in position. So when you set the cam timing, uh, it, was, yeah, it was locked in position and it was a, it was a, it was a great, um, a great feature. So with the 903 RSs, uh, we, we, early on when the cars were fairly new, we, we had quite a few clients saying, this car's not quite right, not quite there on power. And we put it on the rolling road and sure enough, it was down you know, 10, 15, you know, sometimes 20 horsepower. And looking into it, what had happened is this interference fit of, of, the, uh, of the, the pulley wheel on the, on the camshaft, it wasn't keyed, they were, they were slipping. So uh, one of the first modifications we did was to correct this and we'd take the camshafts out and we'd machine the cams uh, to take the vernier sprockets. Uh, sometimes we'd also upgrade the camshaft as well. We had a nice fast road cam. Um, so uh, with the camshaft timing corrected, bang, you know, you were back to your 300 horsepower and, uh, and that was, a, you know, it was, that's where people wanted to be. Um, Suspension wise, we didn't do a great deal. Of course, if somebody wanted to take their car the, the next step, we'd, we'd change the dampers. But the, the suspension on an RS from the factory was very good. Nicely damped, uprated bushes, so it, it was pretty good. So if I think back, the biggest thing we did was, yeah, the camshafts. We had a really nice exhaust system, uh, which was freer flowing. 
so we did a bit of a, a kit where there was a, a remap on the ECU, uh, the camshaft timing set, and the, uh, the exhaust. We changed the exhaust, the headers, cats, back boxes, and it, was, it took the car just over 10%. It was about 330, 335 horsepower. And that was a really nice conversion for the road and track. Um, quite a few RS owners had the comfort seats in the car, so we put, put in buckets. Um, this is something we didn't do on the 964 RS because generally all came with the, with the bucket seats. Um, and then the other thing we did was, um, was the, the final drive. We changed the crown and pinion. The, the 993 was quite long geared, so if you, if you put a shorter crown and pinion, it really sharpened the car up. As a road car, you'd have to say it's the best of the bunch um, in that you've got, if you wanted to do a European trip, you've got all the creature comforts. Generally, you've got air conditioning, decent heating system, decent ABS system. Um, you know, the, the cockpit of the car, the handling of the car, it's supple. I mean, I, I recall a, a trip to, um, to Spa. We, we'd uh, prepared a, a 993 RS for a client to do a track day. And one of the things, we did a few of these in the day, it was deemed to be a bit long geared for track. So we, we put um, a shorter crown and pinion in it, like the, uh, cup car, the super cup cars had. And um, this client, we'd, we'd done, the, we'd done the, uh, the car, but really before it went on track, it needed running in. And uh, I was foolish and stupid enough to say on the day, right, well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll drive it over to Spa and uh, that will give it time to run in and then you can race it around Spa and I'll, I'll drive it home again. So um, this, is, this is a little bit of a story about the civility of a 993 RS. So I set off from work in the afternoon and drove through the night and I got across the border into Europe and it's going dark and I'm bombing along thinking this wasn't such a great idea. I'm tired. I've got to spend the day with this car on track tomorrow, driving it as well with the client. And um, anyway, it, it, was, it was dark and I'm, I'm along the freeway. Anyway, I'm driving along. Next minute, ba 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 Whoa, what's happened here? Anyway, look down and I'd, I'd unconsciously, I was on the limiter in sixth gear. So I can't recall what the speed was, but it just tells you the civility of a 993 RS. But still the 993 RS in no way is a, uh, a stepping stone to a water-cooled car. It's the end of the air-cooled era and a fantastic car in its own right. So then we looked at values for the air-cooled RSs. None of these cars are inexpensive. I asked Josh and Phil what they thought. Are the cars about where they should be? Are any of them overheated or perhaps even undervalued? I, uh, in some ways, they're not valued enough. Um, the Porsche Mark 911, obviously, in, in particular, has got a, such a huge international profile that inevitably you pick out what's the best of the best. Um, and um, pure from, from technical evolution and history and um, the evolving marketplace and international legislation and all the rest of it, the, the, R, the 27RS is without doubt the icon. The problem is that it was basic, just a standard 911 with a bigger engine um, and some bells and whistles bolted on. Well, it's, I wish I could have tucked all the cars that I owned over a period, tucked them in a barn and uh, drip fed them into market because it's incredible. and. You know, I think I think now of the values. Um, yeah, I was owning those cars at less than ten percent of the current values, and it it's, it makes it tough to to consider. And will it continue? Good question. The values have been damaged by. Um, it's like the car I'm in today. It's been reshelled, and, and it's, it's got a, a more than colourful history. Um, but it's a proper RS in every technical term you want to look at. Um, and it drives an RS, it's got the RS papers, but there is a clone market, um, a backdate market, a, um, a, a conversion market that's damaged the values because it makes it difficult for the collector to be confident as to what he's buying and he needs to get the experts in to look at all the nuts and bolts and nooks and crannies and um, it's uh, this is why history has become so vital because 
if it's a proper car, it ought to have a proper history. You know, there's, there's, a, there's an audience for the cars. Um, could, we, could we see what was going to happen all those years ago? I couldn't, some people could, obviously a, a lot more shrewd than I am, but um, it, it's, it is amazing to, to understand the values, but they're limited number. And if you, if you want a piece of history, one of those special cars, you've got to pay for it. And uh, you, c you can argue it both ways that they're, they're, they're overvalued because there are so many of them or they're undervalued because they're so iconic. Uh, when the first million pound lightweight um, went to an auction in, I think it was in 2013, I'm thinking at the time, well, that's, if you look across the marketplace, um, having we we had a I remember we had a Dino in um, in seventy two and um, we were fiddling about with 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 a, with a Dino and finding that it was a, a bit Lotus in some of the construction details um, and its performance against a seventy two nine eleven S was I think I'd rather have the seventy two nine eleven S um, so. The, the, the RS being a pinnacle in an iconic um, range of cars, it was, it was only right and proper that it should hit the million pound mark. In terms of values, the same, I recall back in 1989, I had an opportunity to buy a 27 RS. Um, and in the day, I think it was mid 20s, 23, 24 grand. And at that point, um, prior to that, I had a, I had a 930 replica, so in my mind I, ro I wanted a 930, so I went to see this 27RS, road tested it, did everything, it was fantastic. But then I had an opportunity to buy a 3 litre 930, which a super rare car, and I actually bought that. But it, it just, it puts in my mind values at the time that that 930 was about the same price as a 27RS. Today, 27RS has gone beyond the 930. And the 27RS is a far significant, car, better car to drive than a 930, but the 930 is the iconic looking car. So they, they both tick different boxes. Just can't stop human nature evolving and progressing. Yes, I don't like it. Um, it uh, but equally, I can, it's a natural evolution. You can't tell the marketplace what to do and what not to do. Um, we had cars in that were brilliant cars, were a bit scruffy and, and you'd have a, a beautiful, highly polished car that actually didn't quite drive right. You could always sell the beautiful one and it used to irritate me. Um, in, terms of, in terms of values today, um, I guess I, as long as there's an audience for those cars, they're rare, limited number, they will continue to appreciate in value. There's a huge gap, a chasm even, between the air-cooled RSs and the later cars. I asked Josh and Phil whether they thought they could be compared or are they just two very different types of car? Well, you can compare them, as, compare anything. Um, again, it's just the natural evolution of things. Um, if you look at the early 996, it had the highest brake horsepower per litre of any 911 up to that point, including any production 911 up to that point, including all the RSs. Um, stonking car. Um, the, the problem was they made, they sold so many of them. Um, it, it was, people realized it was just so, like a Boxster. It was just a hell of a lot of car for the money. It's Porsche engineering at its finest. It's, it's the top, it's top of the tree. Um, you know, if we think, if we think about the different generations, so in, in 1972, you know, Porsche pushed the 200 horsepower bracket with the 27RS. 200 horsepower when, you know, it was sort of double most of the other cars. Um, you get into the 90s, yes, the 90, you know, 20 year gap. So, it's, uh, you know, uh, 964RS and 903RS were conceived similar times, but you've gone from 260, I always thought the 964 RS was, you know, the, the power delivery was on, you know, they, they pegged it back. It could have given more quite easily. Um, but then the 903 RS, you're pushing through the 300 brake horsepower barrier. And, and really with the, the, the thermal limits of the engine, it's a two valve air cooled. 
that, that, that's about it. You know, we've, we've still developed air-cooled engines and we can get 350 horsepower. We can get a bit more out of a four liter, but that's about the limit for a two valve air-cooled engine. So, so Porsche needed to go multi-valve. They obviously had the emissions to think about, but multi-valved, water cool, that then allowed them to push through the 400 horsepower barrier. And, and today, I think it's amazing that they're, that they're getting 500 horsepower from the, uh, from the four liter. And they then had the problem, obviously, that they hadn't been able to afford um, the, their normal development curve. Um, and they also suffered at the hands of um, modern communication, IT, forums, all the rest of it. I mean, back in the day, if you go back to the early 911s, they had terrible troubles with the timing chain tensioners on the early 911 engines. Um, with finished up with a 3.2 Carrera being pressure fed rather than the splash of the earlier ones. Um, but we didn't have the web, we didn't have forums. We'd, so <laughs> you'd learnt about it after you'd bought the car. <laughs> it didn't really damage its value in the marketplace. But as soon as you've got IMS failures on 996s, the whole blooming world knows the next day. And it's, it's, it was really rather hard on Porsche, but um, if you, Porsche. But yeah, 500 horsepower, natural, natural aspirated four litre is, is an incredible. And for a production car with a warranty, it's an amazing piece of engineering. So, so that, that engineering today compares with the engineering of the period of what was available at that time and it's pushing boundaries and it, it, it's amazing. Um, you know, current, current electronics um, allow absolute precise monitoring of the, of the fuel delivery, which is, is generally the key to it. But, but yeah, all of these cars are top of the tree when it comes to engineering of the period. And I think we're fortunate, I, I, I believe I'm very fortunate to have, have lived at, through this period and been involved in it to such a level that I have been. Um, yeah, great times. And will it be repeated? I think as things go electric now, yes, very impressive and electric motors can be very impressive. But I think this period of engineering from really from the 70s through to where we are now has been incredible. Well, I then did the terrible thing and asked the guys to do the equivalent of picking their favorite child or their favorite pet. I asked them to imagine that all three cars were sitting on their drive at home and it's a beautiful summer evening. They had the keys. Which one would they take for that lovely summer evening drive? Now with those cars lined up, that's, uh, that's a dream come true. I would have to say the 27 RS. Um, you know, nowadays we talk about an analog car, but an analog car today is something like this you know, without the driver aids. Um, but the, of all those cars, the 27RS is the analog car. Oh, well, obviously the animal I grew up with. I mean, I started the business in 73. Um, so it's, it's the car that I've grown up with and that I know, and I know it's idiosyncrasies and I know I've got to stay awake to, to drive it properly. And, um, and I know if I get in a 993 RS, I can trundle down the road and swear danger of falling asleep and missing the camera. I also think for the road, having raced, there's a certain level that you can drive on the road. And for me, I prefer that threshold to be lower. I actually will say that there's nothing better than a little two litre uh, 911 uh, on skinny tires. The, 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 the pure handling of a short wheelbase and the way you can drive it on the road, again, you have to think about the brakes and that's the two set. For a road car, I've, I mentioned it earlier, that the brakes are, you know, for a fast road driving, the brakes are the Achilles heel. But for that special factor, the noise, the lightweight, the response, that's what I would, that's what I would go for. The fun and the challenge of old cars, your modern classics, they're not old enough. Yeah, they haven't fallen apart yet, and they might never, I don't know. <laughs> so hasn't this been fascinating? If you told me three months ago that I was going to be able to bring together a 2.7 RS and a 964 RS and a 993 RS, and to have them in one place at one time, to drive them, to film them, and to make a movie like this, I'd have thought that was completely unrealistic, it just wasn't gonna happen. 
but it has and it's been amazing and I'm really grateful for the opportunity. As always it would be great if you could like this video and subscribe to the channel. That way I'll be able to keep these videos coming. I'd also love to hear your comments as well. What did you think about the cars? Do you like the format? And crucially, what cars do you think we should feature in the future? I'm sure you've got some great ideas, probably cars that I've never even thought of. Well that's it for now, see you in the next video.